All right, so we're going to get started. Um, thank you guys all for bearing with me last week. I apologize for the uh, the late cancellation notices, but like I said, I would always email you ahead of time, um, though it turns out some of you didn't read your email, so um, <laughs> such is life. But I did try to give you notices as, as soon as I had. I had that set up like six months in advance, so I have no idea why people can't seem to commit to things and follow through with them, but such is life. Uh, thank you all for diligently finishing all of that work. Um, that way we can just kind of keep moving forward. I know some of you already have questions or you ran into snags. A few of you emailed me along the way. That's fine. Um, today isn't so intense that we won't be able to solve those problems along the way too. So I'll come around and I'll help you with any of those individual problems as we go forward. Or let me know if you have any major questions about the stuff that we covered last week. Um, today we're going to start talking about topography. And I actually, I, I love this lecture because there's so much to it that it's, own, it's, it's like its own subtopic of design. And um, those of you that are in 121, you probably have already gotten po posters thrown back at you because you picked the wrong fonts. Like that's like a guaranteed thing in the beginning. So I think it's worth really talking about. And um, it's just, it's such a great way of exploring design through something that we use every day. And I think that's part of what makes it a really unique thing to, to spend a whole lecture talking on. I mean, the truth is that you could spend a lot more than that kind of working through it and talking about, it's always good when your slides are blank. Um, we could spend a whole semester talking about typography. Um, it's, it's that kind of a scenario. So um, here we go. I'm going to start with a definition of terms so that we can kind of have a broad understanding of what's going on. Some of this is, is very obvious. Some of it is not so obvious. Um, and so we'll go through it. Bear with me on the obvious ones uh, with the, the emphasis on the not so obvious ones. So the first thing is style. You're already relatively familiar with this because you've done it in Word certainly before. You have your regular font style. And when I'm saying typography, essentially I'm saying fonts. Um, you have your regular style, then you have an italicized version, and you have a bold version. And you can use those in conjunction with your text. You've probably used the italicized version before in like your English paper when you're quoting something. So um, they're often used to provide some kind of a contrast or emphasis on a particular piece. Obviously, when I just alluded to your English paper, when you're trying to say, hey, this is a quote, and this is not a quote, you're providing emphasis or, or delineation between this is my text, this is the quote. The key here is that you want to choose from within the font family rather than choosing from within the operating system. So when I say that, people are like, what are you talking about? And what's happening here is that people have a tendency to, let's say I'm picking a particular font, I pick, uh, I don't know, Arial. And then I go over a couple menus and I say, make it bold. There's a difference between that and the typeface designer's version of bold or version of italicized fonts. And I'll tell you where you find this. So here is the operating system's interpretation of a font. So we have our font family, hazy, 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 hazy. So we could see um, we have bold, italicized, no, regular, uh, italicized, bold, and bold, italicized. OK? OK, looks reasonable. I can see that. However, if we look at the font family's emphasis here, when we look at this, we see that the italicized version has a little bit more style to the Z. It's subtle but it's carefully considered. The bold isn't just a thicker version of the letters. Some parts of the letters are thicker. One of the crossbars, the Z crossbar, is thicker, but the top and bottom are thinner. So it's a little bit better from a style standpoint when we're looking at that. So there is a fundamental difference. This is available by choosing within the font menu. And you've probably seen this happen before, where you go into your fonts and you'll say, oh, I'm looking at Helvetica. And then you come over, and there's a submenu of bold, italicized, super bold, whatever. That's where you want to pick this from. So here's another example down here. That's just straight italicized text. Essentially, they took the plain text, the operating system, whether it's Mac or, or Windows, they took the plain text, and they just slanted it over. This up here is the italicized version of the font, designed by the font designer themselves. It feels a lot better, and it certainly looks a lot better. So that's a subtle change that you can make that can really make a big difference. It's killing me that my iPad isn't uh, connected. Anyway, weight. Weight refers to the relative lightness 
of, or darkness of the letter forms marked in the thickness of the strokes. So when I say strokes, I just mean the thicknesses of the lines, the curves that make up the letters. So we have light weights, which are nice and thin. We have medium or regular weights, which are kind of in that mid-range. And then we have bolds. And we could take it a step further. This is a full range. I think this might be in the Helvetica fonts, um, where we go from a font weight of 100 to a font weight of 900. And we go thin, extra light, light, regular, medium, semi-bold, bold, black, and super. So this is a complete range of that relative thickness of those lines. So we can really ch play a lot with the text just through these various changes. Width. Width refers to different variations within a typeface family. So you might have a condensed or a compressed version of a typeface where they're cramming stuff together a little bit. You might have an extended version. Actually, this is missing the font. It's supposed to look better. I must not have it on this computer. Um, where it kind of stretches out the letter form. So some of you in like, I won't pick on you in college, but I'll say you were in like 11th grade and you said, I need that paper to be a little bit longer because they said it needed to be two pages. And so you went in your font menu and said, what's the font that is the most spread out? <laughs> and let me apply that font to my paper to make it look longer. Well, guess what? That trick doesn't really work. There's actually a better way. And so there is benefit to this lecture. I'm going to show you how to do it where you can't tell. Okay? So that's coming later. So if you stay awake and listen to me long enough, I'll teach you how to, how to fake out your English teacher. So, Another key thing about fonts or typography is something called the X height. And what the X height is, is essentially the height of the letter X, the lowercase x. And it's a useful comparison to different fonts because that height varies a little bit in various font families. There are what's called ascenders and descenders. You could say the letter P, for example. You know the bottom of the P, the tail goes down, that's a descender. The top of a D goes up, that's an ascender. But the X height is that relative lowercase letter height. No surprise, if we have an X height, we have a cap height. So what is the height of a capital letter in a particular font? The cap height is, again, measured from the baseline to the cap line. The X height and the cap height, or the ratio between the X height and the cap height, is a really useful comparison when you're comparing various fonts, because they're going to change or they're going to be different depending on what fonts you're working with. And if, for example, you wanted to combine two fonts together, you would look for similar X heights and cap heights. So here we are, here we are in the, um, the full layout here. We have our baseline, which is in red. We have our X height, which is the height of the X. We have our ascender and descender uh, heights. And then we have our cap height, which could be the same as, a, as an ascender height but it also could be a little bit different. So those are relative terms that I'm talking about. Counters are the white spaces that are located in and around the letter forms. They can really affect the legibility or the readability of a particular word. Thin fonts at large typefaces, so thin font, really big, have what's called an open counter, where we have so much space around the letters or within the letters that it's hard to read them. It's hard to understand what they look like. The opposite of true, if we have a really small text and we have um, a, a, uh, a closed counter or, or, or where it's really dense together with a big, bold stroke, it's going to be really hard to read those letters because everything kind of mushes together because it's small. So the opposite is true for the bold fonts. So here we go. This is not the best example because obviously you can read both of them. I should really make this one even smaller on the screen. But the idea is that there's so much space around the letters, they become so big relative to the thinness of the lines themselves, that it becomes harder to read the word itself. It gets kind of muddled. So we want to be aware of that. Small capitals are complete sets of uppercase letters that are the X height of a particular font. So they're not the full height of the capital, they're smaller. And you're using those when you don't want to provide too much extra emphasis on a particular test text. So let's say you're writing some kind of a paper and you keep re referring to like DNA. And DNA is written in the paper a bunch. If you use full cap height letters and you keep saying DNA, if you look at that page, every time you look at that page, you're going to pick out all the DNAs because it's just big letters throughout your paper. But if you use a small cap for it, it'll blend in with the rest of the text and not stand out, which can be an advantage to the overall look. 
Lining and non-lining figures, figures here I'm saying are just numbers. Lining figures are a set of numbers with the same width and height as full capital letters. So they start at the baseline and they go all the way to the cap height. This is a normal set of numbers. That's what most fonts have. Non-lining numbers or non-lining figures have ascenders and descenders. So they're meant to go in the body of a text. And you guys are like, why are you telling me this? Well, there's a reason, I promise. And that is when you're writing something like this, you have to decide, just like with those small caps, how much do you want the number amounts to be emphasized? So if you look at the paragraph on the left compared to the paragraph on the right, if you just skim it quickly, your eyes jump to the price of the book, 32% by Amazon, right? All those numbers stand out because they're big. If you look at the paragraph on your right, you can't discern those numbers. You can't pick them out as easily. They flow in the body of the text. So if we're trying to, to have a long paragraph with a bunch of numbers and percentages in it, it makes sense to use the non-lining figures or the non-lining numbers or a font with those so that it blends into the body of the text and doesn't otherwise stand out. Does that make sense? So it's a choice when you, the designer, are choosing how you want these things represented. So ligatures, this is, I guess, the best way of describing this is this is how you naturally write. And I think I'll use my son's name. My son's name is Bennett. And so when you write his name and you get to the end, he has two T's at the end, you automatically draw the two verticals and then you cross the T's together. If I asked all of you to write it right now, you would all do that. It's just natural makes sense. In the world of computers, we have the same opportunities. Technically speaking, the font just has a letter T, and it would put the next letter T next to it, and there'd be a little space in here. But it doesn't look right when that happens. So enter ligatures. So when the font designer, the specialty designer who makes the font in the first place, looks at the font, they say, what letters tend to be combined together? And then when I type those, the computer automatically substitutes and says, oh, you have two T's together. Let me use the special character that includes two T's with the one solid crossbar. So let's show some examples of this. We have our standard ligatures across the top. These are some examples of it. And so things like an F and an I, FFI, you could see on the left, this is what they would look like without the ligature. On the right, this is when the ligature is applied. The crossbar goes all the way across. The dot becomes part of the top of the F. Again, same kind of a, a, if you were handwriting it, it would make sense. Then we have things like discretionary ligatures. To me, some of these end up looking really goofy. Like, I, I don't see that. And actually, there have been some fonts that I've worked with in the past, especially if they're script fonts. And I'll try to show you this in the demo portion today, where there's a ligature that's applied, and you're like, that just looks funny. And you can actually go in and turn that off and say, no, I don't want that ligature, uh, especially if it's one of the cursive type fonts. Um, so those discretionary ligatures, eh, you know, there can be hit or miss, depending on if you like them or you don't like them. Uh, down here in the contextual ligatures, it's really hard to see. There's subtle differences between how the letters come together. Right? They're a little bit closer, but it's something that you wouldn't necessarily notice, and it depends on the font designer as to whether they would really show up or not. So when it comes to choosing the right font, so here's the one that all of you in 121 just ran into. You have to think about how and why you're choosing a particular font, because that font is representing the piece of work that you're working on. So number one, what's the longevity of the piece? How long do you want this piece to be there? Are people going to be reading it in 10 or 15 years? Is it going to be outdated because you use something trendy? What's the purpose of the piece? Are you trying to be innovative? I don't know why you'd try to be outdated, but you could be. Is it traditional? Is it too conservative? So I like to pick on Avatar. OK, so in 2009, Avatar came out, and they used a font called Papyrus. As soon as they used that font called Papyrus, it became trendy, and it was everywhere. It was on takeout. Right? It was, it was on the random signs. It was, it was like populated everything. And then you couldn't see enough of it. I was out hiking last summer, and I ran into this in Tahoe. Why is papyrus there? It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't, it, it's just trendy. So some designer decided it was trendy, it looked cool, so they put it in there. 
it has not aged well. It always looks like papyrus. It was papyrus then. It still looks like papyrus now. Um, we're not trying to be Avatar to bring back the Aspens. Like, it just, no. So be careful when you're choosing a font that it's not something that's just trendy. Like, you really like it. And that's why you're using it. So often, compare fonts side by side to see which ones you like better. Think about the readability of that particular font. You want it, obviously, to be readable. You want to think about what emotion is it evoking? Is it, is, does it match the piece that you're trying to talk about? You're doing a poster on modernist architecture. Is it a sans serif modernist font? Those kinds of questions. Is it legible? We'll talk about the difference between readability and legibility in a little bit. And does it reflect the needs of the client and or the viewer? So here's an example of a quote, a Charles Dickens quote. And I think it's a good one. Both of these, the one on the left and the one on the right, are both perfectly acceptable versions of a font. Right? Neither one is bad. Neither one is necessarily better. Except that the one on the left was designed, the one on the right, sorry, the one on the right was designed around the same time that Charles Dickens was writing. So there's something kind of cool about tying those two things together. Is it subtle? Would you necessarily know that? If I threw these up there and said, hey, which one would you like better? You wouldn't know that necessarily. But it's the kind of thing that designers tend to put into that kind of detail. It's the little things that separate the brilliant designers from the, eh, you're pretty good designers. So an example of that, you could look at Apple Computer and what's happened since Steve Jobs left. Right? Steve Jobs was notorious for saying, no, you're not having another button on my, my phone. You're not allowed to. You know, we, all, we all carry around, you know, picking on Apple for a second. You know the camera started sticking out from the back of the phone? That happened as soon as Steve Jobs died. Steve Jobs wouldn't have allowed the camera to stick out of the back of the phone. He would have said, make it fit. Because those kinds of details are too important. By the way, for a side note, since we're talking about Steve Jobs, and we're talking about typography, do a Google search. You don't have to do it right now, but this is like homework. I promise you, you're not going to waste eight minutes of your life if you do this. Go look at his commencement speech for uh, Stanford, his graduation con commencement speech. It's all about how a class in typography sparked his whole life and his whole design process and why he decided to design the way he did and why details were so important. It's great. So spend a little bit of time looking at that. I've, I almost include it in this lecture and make you all watch it anyway, because it's that interesting. So it's subtlety. It's thinking about what fits right, what, what reads right. And they can be very similar. You look at these two side by side, and they're very close. But which one's better? So a lot of times, just thinking of them side by side and looking at them side by side can make a difference. I just find this amusing. It has no bearing on, on any science whatsoever, but it's just kind of amusing to look at. I threw a link on the course website, too, so you can go look at it. Um, but it's just kind of fun. I also think this one's kind of fun. Uh, these infographics can be kind of fun. Uh, the amusing thing is I found this, and then I started playing around with, oh, you want to do this, you want to design this. And if you follow out the book one, um, and I don't remember it when I answered it, uh, let's see, book. Are you completely in doubt? No. Uh, a champion of usability, perhaps. No. Everybody likes Garamond. Uh, no. Uh, so you want a sans serif. Is that the case? Yes. Boom. There's Optima. That happens to be the font that I put in the book. So it was just kind of a fun little chain, chain, of, chain of results. Um, but it's, it's, you know, it's silly. But this is the thought process that you end up going through about what is the right font. Because there's so many that are so similar. So I've talked a little bit, and I've mentioned it a few times, about the difference between a serif font and a sans serif font. These are two critical differences in typeface design that make or break how your work is presented. And it's very important to think about it, because they both have real good benefits to it. A serif font is a typeface that has serifs. And what I mean by that is these little tiny tails on the letters. So it's not, it's not nearly as clean or modernist, for example, but it's really easy to read. Our brains pick up on those little tails and recognize the letters easily. A sans serif font doesn't have all of those little tails. So it ends up looking a little bit cleaner, but it generally needs to be a little bit larger or a little bit bolder to see it. 
as well. So here we have two paragraphs side by side. The left is a sans serif. The right is a serif font. You can see that the one on the right is a little bit smaller, but I would argue that it's a little bit easier to read because of those little serifs. If you pick up a paperback book, not that anybody actually reads paperback books anymore, but let's say you picked up a paperback book. If you look, it's almost always going to be a, a serif font. If you pick up a magazine, you go to read Consumer Reports, you go to read People, you go to read any one of those magazines that you read, if you read magazines, and you pick it up, I should pick like an architectural or design one, I guess. Right? But you guys don't read those either. You pick up one of those magazines, guess what? It's going to be a serif font. The reason it's going to be serif is because you can fit more text on smaller area. It costs less to print because you're using fewer pages because the text fits on more. So the interesting thing happened when we started publishing everything online, or we started publishing everything on digital, like ebooks and that sort of thing. You can actually go away from using the serif font because you can afford to make things bigger because there's no cost to more pages. You're reading a blog post or you're reading an online article. The font can be bigger. It doesn't matter. You just scroll down. It's actually a whole lot easier to work with because you even you know you have bad eyesight. You can make it bigger as opposed to picking up a book. So we've, we've loosened the requirements a lot for using sans serif over using serif. Combining typefaces. This is the other one that people run into difficulties with. Uh, and I'll tell you the secret in just a second. When you're combining typefaces, number one, if you just stick within a single family type, so that means I pick Arial and I work within that Arial, just larger, smaller text, larger size, bold, italics, Etc. If I'm within that family, everything goes together. You're almost guaranteed to have it look right. So if you pick one font and you stick within the family, you're good. You add multiple typefaces together, it certainly extends the possibility with how you can combine and where you're using certain text. But you have to be a little bit careful when those things combine. So here we go. Here's an all-in-the-family all example. This is Acumen, where we have the regular version as the paragraph, and we have the bold version as the heading or the semi-bold version as the heading. Flows nicely together. If we're going to combine typefaces together, you never want to combine two of the same. So you don't want to take a serif font and combine it with another serif font. They just get confused as to which one's which. You don't want to take a sans serif font and combine it with another sans serif font. They don't go together. So you're always going to be picking a serif font and a sans serif font and putting those together. The other thing that you want to pay attention to is that they should have similar X heights and similar widths, similar cap heights. So that ratio that I talked about before, about the X height, the cap height, the width, those should match up because otherwise they're not going to correspond together. So there's a bunch of example, Big Caslon and Myriad Pro, uh, Savon and Syntax. I can't even pronounce that one, so we're not even going to go there. But here's the trick. So you want to combine typefaces together. This is how you do it. Google, what typeface goes with blah, <laughs> right? And some designer out there has already figured out which one goes with this. So if you want, or you want good font pairs, Google, good font pairs. That's the best way to find a good pair. And I know I say that in a little bit in tongue in cheek, but the truth is it works really well to find good font pairs. There's so many designers out there that post articles about which fonts go together. So here's several examples of how fonts go together. I think this is a good page because it kind of illustrates how e these fonts belong together. They have similar width. They have similar X height. So if we look at the first one up top, it's Avenir uh, 35 Lite and Bembo Book Regular. The X heights are the same. The cap heights are the same. The width of the letters is relatively similar. And they feel like they belong together. Right? We come down here to Franklin Gothic and Cartier Book Pro, same thing. The X heights are similar. Do you guys see that similarity? But if I were to take this one and combine it with that one, they wouldn't work. So they have to match up with those X heights and cap heights. Actually, this one down at the bottom is probably the best example in contrast to the other ones because its width is narrower. So we also have what are called display fonts and script fonts. These are the tidings, tit <laughs> tidings, yeah, where'd that come from? These are the titles, the headings, the subheadings. 
This is the wedding invitation when you use the script font. If you were to take your history paper and you were to write it in a script font and turn it in, they would murder you. So there's an appropriate use for it and there's a non-appropriate use for it. Its appropriate use belongs in the titles and headings section, not in the body text. So designing with type. Legibility and readability are both key factors to designing with type. And they're different. You have to have good both, good legibility and good readability. But there's a difference between the two. So the first one is legibility. And legibility is referring to the recognition of the individual letter forms themselves. So can you understand and can you read what, or can you see, I shouldn't use the word read because we're going to get to readability, can you see the individual letters and their relative position to the other individual letters? So that's legibility. Readability is how the typography is presented as words, lines, and paragraphs. So it's two different scales, essentially. We have, can I recognize the individual letters, and can I read with the, the, the flow of the words, lines, and paragraphs? Good example of this. Okay, you guys are all familiar with a printout of like 12-point font. You know how big that is on a piece of paper, right? If I were to take that 12-point font, and I were to start right here on the board, and I were to write a sentence, or a paragraph, or you know, a paper, and start here, and each line went the full length of the board, that would be really difficult to read. So it would have poor readability, even though the legibility would be good. Does that make sense? That's the best illustration of the difference between the two. So the line length would affect. So here, here's another example. This is pretty good. I apologize. I looked this morning for a less blurry version of this image. I think I might just have to create it. Uh, but I think it's a really good illustration of how this stuff works. So legibility, the first one. Remember, legibility is about the individual letter forms. Can I see the individual letter forms and, and, and uh, distinguish them? So Arial, certainly easy to understand, easy to read. No problem. I can, I can see those individual letter forms. I switch over to Mesquite. Number one, they're all capitals. That makes it harder. But two, just the font itself in that size is hard to read. You have to concentrate a little bit more. I'm not saying you guys can't read it, but it takes a little more concentration. Readability <coughs> has to do with how readable that, that paragraph is. Letter Gothic is still readable. It's just the letter forms are spread out a little bit, so it might be a little harder to read. Um, content, this is impact for a headline, not for a, a paragraph. Same thing as like a script font. Context. This is the other one that's critical. You're talking about financial matters. You're going to use something like a serif, Times New Roman, something like that. If you were to write a paper in Comic Sans for some financial thing, let's say you were, in a, you were writing to your investor group and you, you wrote your uh, you know, cover letter for your K1 in Comic Sans, nobody would teach, take you seriously. Okay? Comic Sans is the official font of elementary school. Like, I, I swear, everything in elementary school is Comic Sans, or some variant of Comic Sans. So there is an appropriate font for your given context of what you're trying to write. Know who that audience is and work with it. Objective rec representation, this is just practical, straightforward representation of content. Clear, ordered presentation of information. Subjective is contextual and interpretive. It's going to be heavily focused on theme or an idea that creates an experience. You guys are going to be working with both in exercise 110 a little bit, both of these scenarios. Macro perspectives. So we've talked so much about the, the fine tune stuff, and we will continue to because we're going to talk about tracking and, and kerning in just a second. But we want to think about the big picture stuff too. So how does the big picture follow suit? And this is more about, did you pick the right font? Does the paragraph line length look correct? That kind of thing. Does it contain a typographic hierarchy of elements, et cetera? Micro perspectives is the little details, the tiny things that make the difference. The best designers are the ones that deal with both the big scale problems and the really small scale problems. In the world of architecture, sorry guys, you just have to listen to me for this. In the world of architecture, the very best architects are the ones that can do the grand plan, the big gesture, 
And when you, when you visit the building and you look at how the door frame interacts with the baseboard, it's elegantly done. The little details are just as elegant as the big form. So it's big perspective and small perspective. That's awful, by the way, for what it's worth. So those are the kinds of things that you as a designer want to teach yourself to do. Think big picture and then compress down into the really small detailed stuff and make sure you address both. I can't even read what this says, but it's beautifully done. Just the combination of fonts, the sizes, etc. Symmetry and asymmetry. This works just like a compositional technique, just like we talked about in the photographs. Symmetry is generally a balance and harmony. Asymmetrical is activity and motion, drawing your eye through a particular piece of that particular page. Alignment. Alignment refers to the overall horizontal position uh, of the typography within the margins. Alignment creates the visual relationships between the various elements of design. So let's look at some specifics about alignment. You guys have probably dealt with some of this before in your English paper, right? We have our centered alignment, and we have something called justified. Centered, obviously, the text flows along the center of the page or the center of the column or whatever the center of your text box would be. One of the, the mistakes that people make in centered is if their lines don't really make sense, right? You just center it and then you have like half sentence here, half sentence there. It's better if you look at it and make sure that it reads appropriately. You don't end at a weird place in the sentence. So if you were to read this, center text is symmetrical, like the facade of a classical building. Center type appears on invitations, title pages, certificates, and tombstones. The edges of a centered column are often dramatically uneven. Do you guys see how that kind of breaks the sentences into chunks? That feels right. If we said the edges of a centered column are often dramatically uneven, it wouldn't feel right. It doesn't have the right flow to it. So if you're using centered uh, as your justification, or excuse me, as your um, alignment, you want to pay attention to that kind of line length. And you can actually insert something called a line break to get to the next line if you want to force it to always break at that point. Remind me and I'll show you where that is. Justified is where you want the left margin and the right margin to end at the same place. So it doesn't have a ragged edge on the side. And this can work nicely as long as you have a large body of text in your column. So if you think about your English paper, it's eight and a half by 11, and you come all the way to the side of the page, you could probably get away with something that was justified if you wanted it to end even on either side, because you have a lot of space in that line to spread out so that the word ends at the edge. If you have a short line, if you have a column where stuff is, is repeating, you're going to end up, if you justify, with really weird gaps in between words because you're trying to make up the space to keep the edges uh, in line. So it works better with a longer piece of text. We have flush left with a ragged right and flush right with a ragged left. This is much more common as a setup to have the ragged edge. It makes reading it a little bit easier. We have a justified on the left side here. This is obviously for English specifically, or for the uh, romantic languages. I don't think English qualifies as one of those, but they would qualify as well as English would. Um, where we're reading from left to right, we have the ragged edge on the right side. You could do the opposite, where you have the, the sharp edge on the right side, and you have the ragged edge on the left, though that's a little bit harder for us to read. We're not used to reading it that way. Um, uh, I'm trying to think if there's any other notes. Oh, hyphenation. That's the other thing that if you don't want quite so ragged of an edge, you can turn on something called hyphenation where it'll break words and put the little dash. You've seen this happen. There's an algorithm built into computers that will do this for you. It doesn't always do it exactly where you want it to, to break, but generally it's pretty good. So if you want to turn that on, that's, that's perfectly okay. Typographic color refers to the density of the typographic elements on the page. So if you were to squint at this example, it doesn't matter what it's saying, but you can pick out which pieces feel darker than other pieces. Right? You can see that that piece feels pretty dark, I think. There's another one back here that's pretty dark. I'm not standing far, far enough away. That one's pretty dark in comparison to this one. So there's a relative color of these. So when I refer to typographic color, it's just the relative darkness 
of that block of text. Because that block of text lives as an element on your page, just like a photograph would on your page. So you want to think about how dark or light it is in comparison to the other elements that are on your page. Type size, you've all done this before. Type size is measured in points. Changes in type size by itself. If you used nothing else and you just changed the single font family and just changed the type size, you could have a nice hierarchy. Heading at 16 point, subheading at you know, 14 point, body text at 10 point. That by itself would give you, you know, footnotes at 8 point. That hierarchy by itself with nothing else would give you a really nice, solid design. Case. Lowercase letters are more readable than uppercase letters. Uppercase emphasizes letter-to-letter -letter recognition, which slows down your reading. So notice that architects write in all capitals. They always have. It's because we want you to think very carefully about what we're saying. We're important. Listen to us. So we make you slow down. For example, it doesn't matter in what order the letters in a word appear. The only important thing is that the first and last letters. This is hard to read, right? You have to think about it. However, read this. For example, it doesn't matter what order the letters in a word appear. The only important thing is that the first and last letter are in the right place. The rest can be a total mess, and you can still read it without a problem. Pretty bizarre, huh? Our brains are used to seeing word forms, and they can translate that. So I think this is a great example of letter-to-letter -letter recognition to read. It's harder to read than when it's in lowercase. And that's because we see the form of the words. I know, isn't that trippy? It's a good one. It's a good one. So kerning. Kerning adjusts the spacing between individual letters. So this is a very, very small scale adjustment. And again, it's kind of like those ligatures that I talked about before with my son's uh, name, Bennett, with the two T's that cross. Same concept here. This is what you would naturally do when you were writing. So if you were to all write the word type, for example, you'd write the capital T, and then you'd tuck the Y underneath the top bar of the T, naturally, right? Same thing would happen, should happen, in a computer. But if this was in our default spacing with no adjustment to kerning, notice that the Y happens after the top bar of the T. This is corrected where we've tucked that underneath. So are you going to go through your whole English paper of 10 pages and adjust the kerning? Definitely not. Would you adjust the kerning for the title? Yeah, probably. So this is small scale detail only when it's really important. So check T, Y, V, A, Y, I. It's, it's everything where you'd want to tuck a letter in. Those are the, those are the big ones. Oh, uh, and the numbers. You know, 1, 1. Sometimes you need to squeeze those 11, to make 11. You'd squeeze them together a little bit. I told you there was going to be a golden nugget at the end. I told you when you needed more space in your English paper because you needed it to be a little bit longer, I'd tell you how to do it. This is how you do it, but don't tell your English teacher I told you how to do it. It's something called tracking, and it adjusts the overall spacing between words, lines, and paragraphs. So the idea here is that instead of using an extended font where the, the characters look funny, if you want a little extra space or you want your line to, to grow in length, or maybe you need it to fit because you only have a certain amount of space to fit your, your piece of text, you can adjust something called tracking that's going to proportionally adjust the space between the paragraphs, the space between the words, and the space between the individual letters, and either extend it all or compress it all. So we're adjusting all of those proportionally. So instead of making just the letters bigger, we're adjusting everything. So this is how you make your English paper longer, hint, hint. Right? I told you there was something important out of this. Uh, it also influences your typographic color. We talked about that before, how dark or light your particular paragraph is on the page. If you want it to be a lighter, you increase the tracking because it's going to spread everything out, a little more white space in between the letters. Leading is the space between lines of text. So if we, it's, it's measured between the baseline of, of one text. We talked about what the baseline is, where the x height starts from 
and the next baseline of text. There's a default that's built in um, to InDesign. I think it's either 1.2 or 1.4 in between those. Um, so if you had a font, it's going to automatically adjust. No, it's not 1.2 to 1.4. It's, uh, if you have, I don't know, we'll look at it. it. There's a default, and I'll show you where the default is. Um, but if you want more space, you would adjust that leading in between the paragraphs. So this is essentially the same thing as saying, I want it double spaced or single spaced. But we have a little bit more flexibility in how it's applied. So fonts with tall X heights, heavy typefaces, and sans serifs, so those without the little tails, need more space between the lines than shorter, lighter, and wider serif typefaces. So if you have the tails, you can compress it more. So more text on an individual page. And so this is a, a portfolio. We're going to spend a whole class talking about portfolios, but I thought I threw some of this in there. I really, I like, this is not one of my students' portfolios. It's just one that I found online. But I think the care with which the typography was done in this is stunning. It's all basically within the same font family, but it's very carefully controlled. There's a nice hierarchy. It reads very clean. And it works all the way through to the, the big bold, super bolds. Um, to the little fold outs. There's just a nice vocabulary that's established through that. Uh, and this one, the, the projector muddles it so you really can't see it. But I was using it as a, uh, an example of using a uh, serif typeface. And I apologize that the projector somehow just doesn't turn out. It's much better on the, on the screen here. Uh, but I also wanted to point out on this page the use of all capital letters to emphasize the quote. So remember, all those all capital letters slow down your reading because you have to look at those individual letter forms. So it can be a big advantage. You want somebody to take the time to actually read the quote, you change the case there. OK, so we're going to switch over um, to the other computer. And we'll go through exercise 110, and then we'll take our break after that. All right, so we're going to get started here um, with InDesign. And um, I'm, going to, I'm going to go through and, and walk you through the text side of InDesign a bit. But if you guys had some questions about InDesign in general and you want me to go over any of that, I'm happy to do that as well at the end. Um, so the first thing that we're going to do today is we're going to create just a new document. And so I'll click on the Create New button here. And uh, we're going to use just a regular letter size piece of paper uh, because we're going to be working with a chunk of text from uh, Vitruvius, who's a famous uh, architect from uh, Rome. And so we're going to use some of his text. He wrote a, a book on architecture. I could actually have a translation of the book in my office that has a bunch of um, hand drawing annotations that go with it, which is pretty cool uh, to look at to kind of explain. Um, anyway, we're going to work with the first chapter of this, not because it's essential that you read it. It's essential because it's a good body of text to just play around with so we can, so we can explore it. So I've gone ahead and I picked the letter size piece of paper over here. Now, on the right side, under the preset details here, we'll see the width and the height are set up in a unit called a pica. And a pica is a default layout unit that's used by like magazine companies. And I think it's a pica. I've always heard of it as a pica. Um, anyway, oh it means absolutely nothing to me. Like I can't tell you what that translates to, other than of course I know a letter size sheet is 8.5 by 11. So when I create a document, the first thing that I always do is I change the units into something I can understand. So for, for our purposes, I think inches is good. If you want to work in the metric system, it's fine with me. Um, when we get to something like, actually in this class we won't, well, we'll, we'll do uh, AutoCAD and we'll do a little bit of SketchUp, in which case working in feet and inches is going to be more universal um, for our purposes. Anyway, I'm going to switch over into units. And I have 8.5 by 11 chosen. Under orientation here, this is do you want it to be portrait or do you want it to be landscape? Either one is fine. Um, I'm going to leave it in portrait for right now. We have the ability to change the number of pages. We're only working with one page today, so it doesn't matter. We'll just leave it as one. The other thing that I will point out, we will talk about facing pages later on in the semester. Um, facing pages just means are you making a book where there's content on both sides of the page? Or are you just making like a handout where there's content on one side of the page only? So it's just it's a um, it's something to do with laying laying out your work. For our purposes right now, I can uncheck it. But if you don't, it doesn't matter because we're only doing one page today. Anyway, 
Um, the number of columns, you could preset a number of columns on the page if you wanted to. I'm not going to worry about that. I'm going to come down to the next one here under margins, though, and I'm going to set the margins to zero. And I think sometimes uh, students initially leave the margin set at uh, a half an inch, which is completely arbitrary on Adobe's part. It has nothing to do with your printer. It has nothing to do with anything. They just set it as a half an inch. And I think it, it often con constricts your creativity. So I take the margins and I go to zero, and then you can always reset them to something if you decide you want margins on the page. But it just kind of clears everything out. So these margins are all chained together, so they were set currently at a half inch, but if I change one of them, they're all going to change to zero. That is done with this little link here. So as long as that link is, oops, pushed the wrong button, but I was done anyway. Uh, as long as that link icon is set, you're good to just change one of them and they'll all change. And you'll notice that when I open it up, the edge of the page, which is in black, also has kind of a pink halo around it. That's because the margins were set to zero. If I had a new document just for contrast, where I didn't, hold on one more. There you go, they're all 0 0.5, I'll create it. There we go. We'd see the pink and purple margins at an arbitrary half an inch in from the edge of the page. So I don't think they're particularly useful, that's why I push them to the sides of the page, and I end up with something that looks like this. The white space on this page is the active page, the gray space on the page is stuff that will get cut out. I don't encourage you to keep things there, but it's technically will get cut out uh, later. So the other, the other piece that we need for this is the Word document that contains the uh, Vitruvius text. It's available on the course website if you go to today's exercise. And you scroll down. There is Vitruvius 10 Books on Architecture, Chapter 1. It's a Word doc file. So I'm going to download that. You'll see it as a Word doc file. It's in my downloads folder. So now that it's in my downloads folder, um, we can go ahead and start working with it. So the other thing that's important to recognize about InDesign, and I would generally emphasize this last class, but since I'm talking to you live today, I'm going to emphasize it today, is that InDesign is based on references. So you have a file, and you're going to create a link between that original file and where it goes in your layout. You're not actually putting the real content in InDesign. InDesign is just about laying things out. It's saying, take this real content and make it end up on this page at this size. It's not, take this content, copy it in, and then it's permanently in InDesign. So it's, it has a set of referenced documents. So in this scenario, if I left my Vitruvius text in my downloads folder, I used it today, I saved it, left, came back on Wednesday, the computer had since restarted, the, the Vitruvius text was no longer in my documents folder, and I went and opened this document, it would say, I can't find the original Vitruvius text. I can't find that Word document anymore. You'd have to go download it and put it back. Does that make sense? So when you're working with InDesign, make sure you take whatever it is you're using and put it somewhere where you're saving it, like on your flash drive. Don't just use it out of the documents folder, unless you're willing to go find it again and replace it. That would be OK, too. Uh, but that tends to be a lot of work. OK, so let's start talking about text. So first off, there is a workspace in InDesign that's centered around working with text. By default, up here, we're listed as Essentials. So this is up in the upper right corner. There's, an, there's a button that says Essentials right now. If you click that downward facing arrow, you'll see that these are different workspaces that are available to us in InDesign. One of those is something called Typography. If we switch to the Typography workspace, it will give us all of our type options over here on the right side. These are still available under the window menus and then under Type which of course I can't find, there it is. All of the things are still available here. 
but it's harder to go into each one individually. So if you switch the workspace as a whole, all of the things that you're going to need, paragraph, paragraph styles, character, character styles, they're all available right there for you. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to create a text box. So I'll use the text tool or the type tool to create a text box on my page. So I'm going to start here and I'm going to create a text box. We'll say something like, let me hold that. This mouse is really being difficult. There we go. And so when I create a text box here, I get a little cursor in it. And I could, of course, start typing something. The cool thing about InDesign is I don't actually have to type into any of these documents. So once I've created the text box, this exists just like the frames you created last class. So you created a frame last class. You guys remember that? The type box exists in the same manner. So it's on the page, and I can work with it. Double click to get inside it and start typing. However, if I click to get outside of it and then select it, I can go to the file menu and I can choose place. I could also press control D. And I could find that Vitruvius text. And I can go ahead and say, put that into my text box. So I'm using my Word document as a reference file just as I would do for an image file. Okay? Now, as soon as I did this, notice that I'm getting missing fonts. Okay? I actually left this on purpose. This is the kind of thing that I could have fixed so that it wouldn't happen for you, but this happens, especially if you work on a Mac and then you switch over to Windows. The fonts are there, but they're slightly different. So we have a couple options. One, there's an Adobe Fonts thing that they're setting up with Creative Cloud. I try not to deal with that because of the way that the school computers are set up. But you can also click on this Find Fonts button, and it will tell you what's missing. So right now, Times Roman Bold is missing, and Times Roman Regular are missing. So if I were to click on this Times Roman Bold, I could go down here to Replace With, and I could go to Font Family, and I could go to Windows version of Times. There it is. There's Times New Roman. So instead of Times Roman, it's Times New Roman. But this was bold. So under Font Style, I'm going to switch to bold. There we go. And I'm going to click on this Change All button. Now that one has been corrected. And over here in my text, you see that it's actually changed. Right? And the pink has gone away. This pink is just highlighting where you've got a font issue. Next one is the Times Roman Regular. I'll come here to the font family. I want it to be Times New Roman, but I want it to be regular. So I'm going to go back to regular, and I'm going to say Change All. And now all of my fonts are fixed. So it's important that you know how to do that. Yes. I might Here, I'll do it over on this document, because it's a fresh one. OK, so I'm going to place that text in. I'll go to File and then Place. There's my Word document. We'll drop that in. And I get the, hey, we're missing some fonts. Let's find our fonts. Then I get the Find Font dialog box right here. These are the two fonts that are missing. It'll tell you that they're missing with this little uh, triangle icon. I select the font itself. Then I come down to the Replace With. And under Font Family here, I'm going to choose the Times New Roman. Heaven forbid I pick papyrus. And my font style would be bold. And then I'll click on the Change All button. Same thing with the regular. It's going to be Times New Roman, but this time it's going to be regular. And we'll go ahead and change all there as well. OK? Yeah? Do you always have to have a box to place something into? No. Um, so when you're placing, this is a good, good question. If you're placing something, so I could go to File and then Place. And I could say, here's my text. We can find it later. It's going to load it up into my cursor like that. 
and when I click, it's going to create a box for me. But it might not be the size that you want. Uh, it's particularly relevant when you do an, uh, an image. If I went to file and then place and I wanted to drop an image in, of course I have no images of any kind on this computer. Uh, hold on a second, let me get into my Do I have something there? I'm just looking for a, a sample image. There we go. When I go to put this one in, if I don't already have the frame, it's going to show up at whatever size and resolution InDesign thinks you want, which may or may not be the size of frame you want. Where if I created the frame first, and then I were to drop it in, like that, then I can right click and say fitting fill frame uh, proportionally and make sure it fits the frame. Okay, so anyway, enough with that for right now. We're back to text. So as I look at the text box here, you see that the, the, the text has shown up, but there's a little plus sign in the, in the lower right corner of this text box. That means that there is more text in the document than will fit in this single text box. When we're working today, there is always going to be more text. We have a whole chapter, we're just doing one page of the chapter. So there's always going to be more. But if I were to create another text box, let's say like this, I can take the text from this text box and link it into that text box. So I can go right here, click that little plus icon, it will load the rest of the text, and then I can drop it into this text box. So the cool thing about this, let me resize this down a little bit, is that if I decided, you know what, I want more text up here, it will automatically adjust and flow through these documents. So if I say, you know, I want this to be a little bit wider, it will always be adjusting the text to fit in those pieces. So it's not like in Photoshop, if you tried to do this, for example, you'd have to manually say, well, where's the break from this line going into the next line? And if you adjust it, you'd have to compensate. This flows right through the document. So I'd be able to, for example, create another text box. Oops, sorry. Right here. And I could chain from this. Oops, didn't click it. There it is. Into that. And so it's continuing to flow through on that particular page. If I decided I didn't want so much up here, I could very easily shrink that back, and it's going to put the start of my text there. Do you guys see how that adjusts dynamically? That's one of the big advantages of working with text in um, InDesign. So let's go ahead, and I'm going to pull these guys up just a little bit higher. I'm not paying particular attention to the exact um, specifics of these text box sizes, but they're close enough for our purposes. Now, the other thing that people say is, well, what happens if I go back into my Word file, my original Word file, and I make a change? Please don't make me log in. Oh, good. <laughs> Thinking it's going to make me log in. OK, so I'm in the original Word file, and I say, you know what? I really don't want that link in there anymore. So I can delete that link because it's open and viewing all the enable. Oh, God. I, I, I have to admit, I absolutely despise Word. It's awful. It's a terrible program. Anyway, um, so let me go ahead and save this. There we go. I can close that. Now, when I come back to InDesign, right, we see that, oh, wait, it didn't update. I can open up a window called Links. Let me go to Window and then go to Links here. No, how about that? It's supposed to show up right there, but it didn't. So in that case, I'm going to have to go back to this first uh, box and go to File and then Place, and then I'll just replace that text with the one that I made the adjustment in. Now, the cool thing about it here, I have to go through this again. Whatever, I'll do it later. Oh, come on. I love it when, when demos don't work the way they're supposed to. Uh, let me get inside the text. I'm going to select all the text, and then I'll go to File and then Place to force it into that box. 
Yep, there we go. So I just replaced it on the inside. So it, my fonts were, uh, were, were screwed up, but that's okay because we're going to adjust them now anyway. Okay, so as I'm starting to work with it, I'm going to start with this first paragraph here. And I'm going to work within that paragraph. We'll continue on with the rest of the paragraphs. So I have two different things that I can work on relating to the paragraph. So I can control what the font is, or I can control the letters, and I can control the paragraph. So if I'm looking here, on the right side, I've gone ahead and I've, I've double-clicked to get inside of my text box, and I've selected the whole paragraph. I can then come over here into my character palette, and in character, I can choose what the font would be. So I can say what, it, what I would like it to be. Let's see here. Sure. Okay, so I picked that. Now I can pick the size that I want it to be. So I can say, you know what, I really want it to be more like 10 point. Maybe I want it to be more like, uh, sorry, I want it to be, I don't know, 12 point. There we go. Okay, so I'm working my way through making those adjustments. That is all in the character setup. The paragraph is settings that are dealing with the paragraph. So across the top, we have our alignment. We have left aligned to the right, aligned centered. We also have justify left, center, and right. We have full justify, although in this scenario, yeah, you can see that it really messes with the spacing quite a lot. OK, so I'm going to click with, I'm going to stick with this one, the align left. I have the ability to adjust the margins if I wanted to, so I could indent. I could also go backwards on the first line if I wanted it to stick out, for example. Just using those. You can also indent the, to the, the right side. You can create a margin on the right side. You can, I, I've never figured out why you would want to worry about indenting the last, last line from the right. I, I've never understood why that was an option, but you can do it if you want. I can control the space before the paragraph, and I can control the space after the paragraph. Um, let's see here. We'll get to the drop caps in just a second. So I'm going to leave it like that for right now. Now, this paragraph is already set up kind of the way that I want it set up. Oh, I should also point out that this particular word there is different than the rest of the words. Uh, and I wanted to emphasize that word. So I've picked knowledge. So I could come in and I could change that one to be different. So right now it's already set up as bold, for example. OK, so the thing about it is I've, I've got this paragraph looking the way I want it to look, but I'd like these other paragraphs to look the same way. Well, InDesign has something that they call character styles and par uh, paragraph styles that are designed to do just this. They're designed to allow you to permanently set up a style, or it's kind of like a CSS, a cascading style sheet, if you're familiar with uh, web design, where you say, this is what I want this particular type of text to look like. Apply that to it. So for example, if I'm inside of this paragraph, I've set it up the way that I want, I can come over to my paragraph styles window, and I can say, create a new style from this paragraph. So as long as I'm inside of this paragraph, I can click on this little create new style button. It will create a style from that paragraph. It's called paragraph style one. And I could change it to something like, uh, I don't know, serif font or maybe body serif or body, standard body or just body. I don't know, Some, something that, that means something to you. So that's been set. Now if I come to the next paragraph here, I can apply that body style to it, and it's going to look exactly the same. So I could move to the next paragraph, and I could say I want it to be body again. Do you guys see how that works? Now I talked about this word knowledge being important and emphasized. I could create a character style that represents the emphasized word. So I've selected the word. I've come down to character style. I'll create a new character style, and I could call this one, oh, sorry, let me just rename it here. Uh, we'll call this emphasize. There we go. So that word is now emphasized. 
Down here, manual skill is supposed to be emphasized, so I'll click on that style. Scholarship needs to be emphasized. All right, you guys get the idea. So I have a paragraph style that represents the body, so we might as well make this one body and this one body. And I have a, oops, there's another word here that should be the emphasized character style. So the beautiful thing about this is if you decide down the road that you, you know what, I really don't like having the uh, justification the way it is, I can go to my paragraph styles, I can double click on body, and changes that I make here in the paragraph style options will affect all paragraphs that have that style assigned to them. So I could come in here and I could say, you know what, under my uh, justification, no, wait, that wasn't right. Uh, indents and spacing, there we go. You know what, I really didn't want it to be indented that way. I just wanted to have it straight on the side. So I've made that correction. And when I do that, all of the paragraphs change. So I can make one change and have them all change. Now under character styles, on that emphasized, we can have some fun with that one too. So I can come in here and I could say, let's go to basic characters, and I, I want that to be a completely different font. So I could come in here and pick an entirely different font. I don't know what ink-free looks like, but we'll see, right? Um, and I want the size to be bigger. I want it to be, let's say, 14 point. As soon as I do that, I could also change the color of it. I could say, you know what, I want that color to be... Uh, I don't know, red, and when I'm done, all of those will adjust. So the beauty here is that if I didn't like that it was red and I wanted it to be blue, I could just double click on that character style, go back into my um, character color, and I can say, you know what, I'd rather have it in blue, and then they're all going to change to blue. Does that make sense? So once you have this set up, you have a lot of flexibility for how you change it. So every time you create something uh, in your text, you know, a special, uh, a special font or a special look, you want to set up a paragraph style and a character style for it. Now we have some other things that we can do. I'm going to go back into my paragraph styles. I'm going to double click on body again. And I'm going to say, OK, if we come down here under our drop caps and nested styles, what drop caps do is they make the first um, letter or letters, depending on how many you pick, bigger than the rest of the letters. So let's go ahead and explore that a little bit. So I'm going to say I want it to take up two, uh, two lines, and I want it to be two characters. So that would be the one and the period. When I do that, I would go ahead and say OK, and you'll see that the one now takes up two lines, and it's two characters, so I get the period. Same thing there. If I didn't like it or if I wanted to change the font of that, I could also create a character style for that and apply it to the, the first numbers. Or the, uh, the, let me come back here. I could say, let's make it three instead. That would take up three. Do you guys get how that's adjusting? So I could create a character style for this. Oops. So let me come in here to character styles, and I could create another one. I'm not, by the way, trying to say that this is attractive. I'm just trying to show you how all this works. Okay? So I could say this is a number, and let me double click on it. And again, I could fit, pick a different font for it. It would be nice if I know the Windows fonts better, because I really don't. Try stencil. Sure, that's got to be ugly. Um, and so we'll go ahead and say OK. And so now that's the stencil font. But if I applied it to the rest of these, it would now be there as well. OK? So I'm going to come up here to um, this, the Education of the Architect, this title here. 
And I want to uh, change the case on this. So I'm going to go up to the type menu and I'm going to go to change case and I'm going to go to sentence case so that it goes back to not being all caps. Okay, so that was under type, change case, and I went back to sentence case. And then I'd like to apply some kind of a uh, script font to this. So I'm going to use the character menu. I'm using the character menu because I want to see the previews because, like I said, I don't know. Okay, let's use this one. So I have the education of the architect in script form. I'm going to make it bigger. like that, which may necessitate making that text box a little bit bigger. There it is, the education of the architect. Um, it is asking for a bold, I believe. We're just going to choose that it's regular. That's going to get rid of that pink highlight because it was originally asking for it. Okay, so I ha now have the education of the architect there. I would create a character style, and this character style would be for heading. Okay, and now that's set. Now in here, let's see if it's available. I want to pay some attention to what's happening. Let me zoom in. I'm going to press Control Plus. This is where those ligatures start to matter. So if, for example, I put two T's together, it's supposed to connect them together, although I don't know. This font might not have it. Let me get back to you on that because I need to find on Windows. I know how to do it on my computer, but I have to figure out where, where the options are. I was going to show you how to turn on and off the certain ligatures, but this font might not even have them built into it. Um, so I'll get back to you guys on that one. But let's explore some of the other options that are available for us. Uh, I'm going to use this chapter one as well. Let's assign that something. Sure. Okay. So, as we look at our characters, we have other things that are happening here. This is our kerning. So, if I wanted to adjust the spacing in between letters, so if the H and the A were too close together, I could come over here to my kerning and I could adjust it. Whenever you see a value that's in parentheses, that's the computer automatically adjusting it for you. So, it already adjusted them closer together, but I could spread them out if I wanted to. That's now back at zero. Right, we can see it. Let me do type just so you guys can see it. There they are lined up. I could come in here and I could say, let's tuck that under further. Do you guys see how that's adjusting? So that's my kerning. My tracking right here, remember that was a paragraph setup. So let me go down into this paragraph one. Let me go into my uh, paragraph settings. Actually, that's interesting. It's available under the character menu. And right here is my tracking. And I could say, okay, let me select the whole paragraph. And I'm going to go to my tracking and I'm going to say, let's extend that out. And you see that it changes the, the color of the text, but it's evenly spaced out the letters and the space between the words to make the overall body longer. That's yeah. I know, i got to figure out why some, there's a setting wrong. This has to do with the Word file uh, that came back in. There looks like there's a little extra space there, too. It may also just be a weird artifact that when we export it will go away. So I will, I will double check on that uh, as well. So let me come back up here. We can get rid of that type part. Good. Uh, let's see if there's anything else we want to go through. Uh, if, for example, you wanted an individual letter to become a superscript, you could choose to have one letter move up. Um, you can manually adjust the width of a letter, though I'm not quite sure why you would want to adjust that. Let me pick a particular letter that's easier to see. I could say that I want that to be wider for some reason. You can do that. Likewise, you can also say that I want it to slant to a certain, certain degree. Again, use the italicized form, not just slant the letter over. Uh, but it's available to you. Superscript, the uh, height of a letter. You could change the height of that individual letter so that it's taller. Uh, whatever, I'm just going through the various options for you. Okay, all of that sounds... Oh, leading. 
So this is the space between individual lines of text right here. It should be set by default. When it's set, uh, you'll get these parentheses, but you can, you can adjust it after the fact. So if you wanted, um, sorry, let me select this whole paragraph. Like that. I'll come here to the leading and I could say, instead of being auto, I could say I want it to manually be set to 10. And you can see that now everything's kind of squished together. I could say that I manually want it to be set to 18 and it's going to spread everything out. Or alternatively, I could go back to having it set for auto. Uh, let's go ahead and set it at 14 like that. Okay. So remember, all of these changes can be applied via the, uh, the, the character and paragraph styles. I'm just kind of showing you various options. Uh, I found that frequently with students, the easiest um, strategy is to get one paragraph or one word looking the way you want it, create a style from that, and then apply it to everything else, rather than try to create the style first and then edit it using the styles menu. It's usually easier to see it while you're visually looking at it. Uh, get it right and then save it from there. Uh, OK. Paragraphs, uh, or paragraphs, I think we already went through the bulk of these options, so I'm not going to worry about those too much. We did drop caps, etc. We can choose to add space after a paragraph or before a paragraph, thereby forcing it before or after. In this case, it's always after. Uh, I would stick to one or the other when you're applying it. So under our part one here, I want you to play around with getting your... Um, your uh, Vitruvius text laid out on a page. Oh, the other thing I should point out is putting an image in here. So let me back up just a little bit. So let's say that I have an image frame. You guys created image frames last class, and it looks like that. And I want to place an image in it. I'm going to move it down just a little bit. There it is. I'll go to File, and then Place. And I would pick an image. Going back to uh, one of those from before. These obviously have nothing to do with Vitruvius, but such is life. I'm going to right click here and I'm going to go to fitting and we're going to fill frame proportionally just so we can see a little bit more of it. Like I said, nothing to do with Vitruvius at all. Now, in this scenario, I have this nice little image here, but the text goes right behind it. Well, InDesign has the ability to wrap text around a given image file. So with the image uh, selected, I'm going to click over here on the text wrap. And I'm going to choose to have the text wrap around the image. And so it's wrapping around the image. If I want to control how close a word can fall next to my image, I can add this padding, or this they call it offset, around my, my frame there. So there it is at a 16th of an inch. So nothing can get closer than a 16th of an inch to that frame. So as I move this around, it's going to wrap the text around it. So even if I move it to the center, it's going to keep wrapping everything. So no matter where I put it, it's going to always be working around my particular object. If I wanted the image to um, not have this little bit there, I could choose to just break the text to jump the object and have this in between if I wanted to. So I've got flexibility in how it applies. So you can look at it there. Uh, if you have a round object, you can have it wrap tight around the object, or you can wrap it around the bounding box of the object. Um, in this scenario, I just have a rectangle object, so it doesn't really matter. But let's say that I had an ellipse. There it is. Sorry, I need to get rid of that um, frame color. So in this scenario, I could take my object and I could either wrap it around the bounding box or I could wrap it around the object itself. Which again, may or may not, oops, may or may not be what you want the look to be, uh, but I'm just trying to show you how this works. So I can do the same thing with the padding where I can increase some of the padding around it so we have more or less space around my particular object. But you guys get the idea. 
certainly. Okay, so that's dealing with images. So there's no requirement for images on this first bit, but what you're doing is you're creating one page of a Vitruvius layout. The purpose of that first part is to experiment with all of this stuff and to kind of decide how you want to create uh, text, understand what your paragraph styles are, what your character styles are, how do you create them, etc. Um, I'm going to skip part two. We're not going to worry about uh, installing a free font. Uh, it's actually even easier than before. Um, well, I might as well show you a little bit. So there's, there's a bunch of free fonts that are available online. If you don't like the fonts that are on an operating system, it's actually a good way of kind of customizing your work a little bit. Uh, Google Fonts actually by itself has a great collection of free fonts. So if you do Google Fonts, um, it's fonts.google.com. Um, they have a bunch. You can search for, uh, let's see, right? We could just do handwriting fonts, for example, and you could pick something that, that you like. So here's one. Uh, if you like it, we can click on it. There it is. Uh, we can select this font and then somewhere, right, we can download it right here. These fonts are actually designed to be used on the web, but they allow you to download them and install them. So let me go ahead and show it. I need to extract it. Uh, whoops, let me extract all. And again, put this on your uh, flash drive. Don't leave it on the desktop because you would need it the next time you uh, did it. Uh, and then actually, we don't have to go through all the steps that I have talked about in here because uh, the current version of these computers in the lab will allow us to just double click on the font and install it. So I have it installed and I could go back up to this. Remember, which was a subheading, so I could go to my character styles and go to heading. I could double click on it. I could go into my fonts, and that was called Sacramento. Oops, if I can type. There it is, Sacramento, and now it's in that font. So if I wanted to do that again, I would, of course, have to um, uh, in install it again, if that makes sense. So if this computer restarts, it's not permanently installed on the computer. You'd have to keep the font and install it again before the next time you opened it. I'm um, just trying to double check here if, um, yeah, this is, I was hoping that this font would be one that had uh, the ligatures but there, it doesn't look like it has the ligatures on this one either. I, I will find a font to show you that part of it uh, if you want to change the ligatures. Um, I'll have to look on my computer and, and, and see which one has it. Okay, if there's no questions, I'm going to let you guys start to work. The last part here, I should mention part three, uh, I ask you to work on a self-reflective word art. Uh, if you do a Google search for word art, I'm just going to go into Google Image. It's essentially you're making up a composition uh, based on fonts. You don't have to do like a self-portrait like that, but you can make something like this using words that describe yourself. Like that. So it's just a composition of words that describe you. right? It'll help you get used to words, fonts, choosing font styles, etc. Does that make sense for what word art is? So after you get through the Vitruvius part, you're going to do a word art piece. The word art piece is far more interesting than Vitruvius. So when you make your post, go ahead and post the word art part. I'm not worried about the Vitruvius part. I don't really need to see that. Okay. Um, let's see. When you go to export Word, or it's a Word, God help me. Uh, when you go to export InDesign, we're first going to save our InDesign file. So I'll go to File and then Save. And this saves a .indd, which is an InDesign document. Now, of course, the school computers are working on the 2019 version of InDesign. If you have Creative Cloud on your home computer, you have the 2020 version of InDesign. I don't know how cross-compatible those two are. Um, probably not. InDesign is notoriously difficult. So um, if you take your 2019 document, it will open just fine in 2020 but it will not go back to 2019, particularly easy. If you need to go back to 2019 from 2020, you can actually do a save as, and you're going to do this um, 
IDML file and it might work. <laughs> Emphasis on the might part. Um, so just be aware that, that that's the way InDesign works. If you want to work on your laptop because you have 2020 and you want to work on that version, that's fine with me. Um, you just recognize you have to stick within that, that version type. So first thing we'll do is we'll save our, our INDD file. Um, so I would save that on uh, the computer. And then I would go to File and then Export. And instead of exporting a PDF, we're going to export a JPEG. So I'll change my export type to JPEG. I'll choose where I want it to save and what I want it to save as. When I click Save, it's going to bring up this Export JPEG options. So a couple things we're going to change here. Under Quality, we're going to change to Maximum. And under Resolution, we're going to change to 300. If you do it just at 72, it's not going to, it's going to end up blurry. And some of you may have discovered that when you did the export uh, last class. So quality is going to be maximum, resolution is going to be 300, and then you'll go ahead and click on export and it will save that JPEG fo file for you. That's then what you will post. Okay. Uh, again, I don't care about the Vitruvius, you don't have to post that part, that's for you to experiment with and get comfortable with. Do the word art and then post the word art. Okay. I know I talked for quite a while today, I apologize for that, but such is life. Some, of the, some days are like that. Uh, so I'll let you guys work, you got about an hour and a half left to finish. I'm coming. Unless it's a question for everybody. I guess, is the word art going to be on the same size? Like it can be whatever size you want. Any other questions for everybody? OK, I will come help you in just a second. Let me save this lecture, and then I'll come. Yeah, you guys can take a break. It doesn't matter. It's lap. So it's just between now and lap. So I'm not going to talk again, so you're, you're good.